Hey everybody, Dr. Reviso here. In this video, we're gonna talk about the lymphoid tissue, and this is a new unit, so we're just starting immunology here. We're really gonna start with the bare bones basics in this video, and then we'll build up on some of the more difficult concepts to grasp. But in this video, we're primarily gonna just talk about you know, some basic types of lymphoid tissue. We'll talk about some of the primary lymphoid organs, and then towards the end of this chapter, we'll talk about the secondary lymphoid organs, most notably the spleen and the lymph node. Like I said, we're just gonna start with the basics here. So um, when we're talking about lymphoid tissue, the way to organize this in your brain without you know, going back to your histo and having to know all the little details, the big thing here is to just organize this into primary and secondary types of lymphoid tissue. And so the primary types, the two big ones being the bone marrow and the thymus, which we'll talk about here. And you know, the thing to remember about the primary lymphoid tissue, that's primary because this is where your lymphocytes are usually gonna form particularly in the bone marrow, okay? And then we're also gonna have lymphocyte development. So in the bone marrow, think B for bone marrow, B for B cells, primarily development of B cells in the bone marrow and development of T cells in the thymus. So we'll talk about that in a second. And then in terms of secondary forms of lymphoid tissue, the big two here are gonna be the spleen and then the lymph node. And we'll talk about each of those in a little bit more detail uh, in the upcoming video. But the idea here is these secondary tissues are not necessarily creating the lymphocytes, right? like you'll see in the bone marrow, but instead this is where we're gonna have lymphocytes activated, antigens that are coming in or antigen presenting cells that are coming into the lymph node, for example, to cause activation of B cells, T cells, and eventually proliferation of those cells. Okay, starting with the primary lymphoid organs, we're talking primarily about the bone marrow and the thymus. And remember the bone marrow, the, the big thing to remember here is that this is where these cells are gonna form. That's where we're gonna turn hematopoietic stem cells into cells of the lymphoid lineage. So this process again is happening in the bone marrow. Okay, so this is gonna be happening in the bone marrow. We're gonna start off with a hematopoietic stem cell. And so these cells, they can differentiate a couple different ways. Two of the big categories here is gonna be the lymphoid lineage and the myeloid lineage. Now in general, the lymphoid lineage is what we're primarily focused with when we're talking about immuno. Okay, so in this unit, we'll primarily be on this side of the diagram. When we go on to Hemonc, right, we'll talk more about some of the myeloid lineage cells here, okay? But for this video especially, and this chapter in general, we're mostly gonna be talking about lymphocytes. And so the lymphoid lineage forms lymphocytes. And the three big ones to remember here are gonna be B cells, T cells, and NK cells. These are natural killer cells, okay? And now the natural killer cells in general are gonna be part of the innate immune system. Okay, so these are gonna mostly be innate immune system. And you'll see that the B cells and the T cells are gonna be part of the adaptive immune system. Everything here, by the way, is pretty much all also gonna be part of the innate immune system. Kind of confusing, but again, these are just ways to organize these in your brain, is that you can see that all of these cells come from hematopoietic stem cells in the bone marrow. And so they're all going to be formed initially in the bone marrow, that's the important part. So the B cells and T cells both come from bone marrow. Where they mature is what's different. So the B cells are gonna mature in the bone marrow, right? So they're gonna stay in the bone marrow and mature in the bone marrow. Remember, B for B cells, B for bone marrow. That's where they're gonna mature. Now the T cells, they're gonna be formed in the bone marrow, but they mature in the thymus. So T for T cell, T for thymus, okay? But remember that all three, the B cells, the T cells, and the natural killer cells all form from hematopoietic stem cells that undergo into the lymphoid lineage. And this is stimulated by interleukin-7. We're gonna talk about this in great, great detail to come. And again, the big point here, B cell proliferation and maturation happening here in the bone marrow. Now the second major primary lymphoid organ is gonna be the thymus. So I put on here a couple of the big things to know. Now in general, you know, there's a lot of information you can talk about when you're talking about the thymus, but I just wanna remind you again, we're just kind of focusing on what's the big high yield stuff that we have to know. First thing that I would say, just to go back to your embryology, because we kind of already hit this a little bit in some of the previous videos, but remember the thymus is derived from the third pharyngeal pouch. Remember your pharyngeal pouches are associated with endoderm. So pharyngeal pouches, remember, these are gonna be associated with endoderm. It's important to remember this because remember in DeGeorge syndrome, we have some abnormal development of the third and the fourth pharyngeal pouch, right? So these pouches don't form correctly in DeGeorge syndrome. So you can imagine because the thymus comes from that pouch, if it doesn't form correctly, you're gonna have deficiencies with the thymus. And so this is why with DeGeorge syndrome, we classically see this thymic aplasia, right? The thymus doesn't really form the way that it's supposed to in DeGeorge syndrome. And this has implications in the lymphoid system because remember the T for thymus is for the T of T cell maturation. 
Okay, so if the thymus isn't working, then the T cells are not going to mature like they should. Remember, this is where the T cells are going to come to mature. And we're going to talk about that process in great detail. But there's a selection process, essentially, that's going to happen in the thymus as these T cells prepare for maturation. So again, if we have a disorder where the thymus isn't working, or we have thymic aplasia, we're not going to get T cell maturation. And so that's going to have some pretty significant consequences, as we'll talk about in the upcoming videos. Also, a little bit lower yield, but it's important to remember the thymus is an encapsulated organ. It has a pretty fibrous, thick capsule, as opposed to some of the other tissues, um, like the spleen, which is very thin. And in general, you'll occasionally get histology images. The thymus isn't as high yield uh, as compared to like the um, lymph nodes, for example. But just one thing to note here about the thymus. So in general, remember the cortex is going to be darker staining. So we're going to have a higher concentration of lymphocytes out here. So this whole area out here, this is going to be your thymic cortex. And then in the center, you're going to have the medulla, which is going to be lighter staining. In general, the cortex is going to be more superficial for these lymph foot organs, the medulla is going to be deeper. And the one classic histologic image that occasionally comes up here for the thymus is going to be these hassle corpuscles. Now they don't really have, you know, a very clear function. So there's nothing to really remember in terms of, you know, physiologic function with these hassle corpuscles. But the thing to remember is that number one, they're located in the medulla and just kind of recognize their appearance. When I see this kind of whirling, swirled appearance, I'm almost thinking of what you see with keratin pearls in a way. It's, they're not completely related, but the representation uh, of these hassle corpuscles, that's kind of what it reminds me of in a way. And so that's kind of how uh, I would organize it in my mind. Now, we already talked about DeGeorge syndrome, thymic aplasia, because you have abnormalities in the formation of the third and fourth pharyngeal pouch. You can also see severe combined immunodeficiency is where you're basically wiping out your B cell and T cell population. And again, I'll talk about this in, a, in much greater detail to come, but this is also classically associated with thymic aplasia. Um, the other big place that the thymus comes up is with thymomas. And myasthenia gravis, if you ever have a question, like we talked about in the neurology section, where you have a patient that has myasthenia or very classic symptoms of myasthenia, right? You do an ice pack test or something and um, you know their symptoms improve or whatever it is, or they have some fatigable weakness and you're thinking myasthenia. In those situations, if you have solid evidence for myasthenia gravis, usually they'll say, okay, what's the next best step? CT scan just to look for a thymoma, okay? Which would be some kind of mass, potentially something that's perineoplastic, releasing antibodies causing myasthenia or causing, causing worsening of symptoms potentially from the thymoma, okay? So that's why we look for those. Now, what I want you to remember, and this is, gets very confusing, especially for your first couple of years of medical education, when you look at you know, a pediatric x-ray here, okay? So you might be saying, what is going on with this patient? Why is there this mediastinal widening? If I see mediastinal widening like this in an adult patient, you know, I might immediately start to rattle off my differential. Is this an aortic dissection? Does this patient have anthrax, right? If I see some mediastinal widening like that. But if we're talking about a pediatric patient, particularly a patient that's like an infant, normally they're going to have a prominent thymic sail sign is what it's sometimes called. In general, they're going to have um, a larger thymus. And so this is actually quite normal to see this very wide thymic tissue here, believe it or not. Now, as we age, what happens is over time, that thymus starts to involute a little bit. So that thymus is going to get a lot smaller and it's going to get replaced with fatty tissue. And that's completely normal. That's what's supposed to happen. We shouldn't see massive mediastinal widening in a patient that's 40 years old, for example. In those situations, we might be going through our differential. Potentially, if they have myasthenia, we might be thinking thymoma. Okay, so just kind of keep that in mind. It's important to recognize the age of the patient you're dealing with when you see some of these images.